Today on Building the Broncos, Carl and Nick discuss Denver's release of running back C.J. Anderson and what it means for the position going forward as we approach the NFL draft, some of our favorite non-round one quarterbacks, and our draft day nightmare scenarios. This is Building the Broncos. Welcome to Building the Broncos with your hosts, Nick Kendall and Carl Dummler. Hello there, Broncos country. I am your host, Carl Dummler. And with me, as always, I have my co-host and good friend, Nick Kendall. Nick, how are you doing, man? I am doing pretty well. I feel like I always come on here and complain about the weather, but it is snowing right now. And it is April 18th. And it is it is snowing. And I feel like it's been terrible forever. And it's driving me bananas. I know this is a, not a, just an issue in Iowa City, where I live. It's all across the country right now. But I'm looking at my phone right now, Denver. 58 degrees, Iowa City, 33 with snow the next two hours. So, man, just horrible. <laughs> I, I Well, I got 75 mile per hour winds here. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, the uh, they shut down highways because the visibility is so bad. So Denver people, man, count your blessings because it's, uh, it's a nice day there compared to where we are. And we are a little bit jealous that you not only live where the Broncos play, but you have great weather, you have the mountains, you have a lot of things that we don't have in Iowa or Kansas, but that's all right. We can still talk Bronco football, and that's what we're going to do here today again on our new show, our new titled show, Building the Broncos. And I want you to know that this show's focus is all things pertain to your Denver Broncos, especially as it relates to the upcoming NFL draft. With Nick and myself being draftaholics, we'll be bringing you fresh insight and analysis each and every week and every single episode. From scouting reports, player value, scheme and personnel fits, and of course, just a little bit of general draft-related banter. You can follow myself on Twitter at Carl Demler MHH, as well as follow Nick at Nick Kendall MHH. And be sure to tweet us any questions or opinions you have, because we really do live for, for talking Bronco football. You can also follow the podcast Twitter account at Huddle Up Pod, and make sure you check out ours and our co-writers' written content at MileHighHuddle.com, a part of 24-7 Sports and an affiliate of the CBS Sports Digital Network. We know you listeners are as football draft and Bronco crazy as we are. So please give us a click and subscribe to us on iTunes as well as Stitcher. And don't forget to share us on Facebook and Twitter. We wouldn't be here today without you listeners. So as a call to action, please go and take the time to go to iTunes or Spreaker to rate and subscribe to let your voices be heard on how you enjoy our show. Well, we, we got to start with the, the big news other than the draft coming up for the Broncos. And that is CJ Anderson being released by the Broncos. And this has been something that at mile high huddle, if you've, uh, if you have our insiders forum or insider articles, this is something that we've been saying is going to, was going to happen for a long time. He's either going to be traded, take a pay cut or be cut. There was no way that he was going to be on this team at his current salary. And uh, this is kind of one of those, you understand business wise, why the decisions made, but player wise and just some of the memories with CJ Anderson, uh, what, what's, what's your favorite memory of CJ Anderson here with the Broncos? Oh man. Favorite memory. I have three that really stand out to me. I have the, it was a second season as a Bronco, but his first season really are having a prominent role. It was that touchdown he had against the Raiders in the past game where he, I feel like he juked three or four guys. <laughs> yep. That one uh, was, uh, uh, was near the top of my list. Then it's the 2014 playoff loss where he broke like four or five tackles, it seemed like, to get a fourth and two to extend the drive. And if Demarius Thomas or Emmanuel Sanders would have blocked, it could have been a touchdown. That's up there. And then, of course, the the touchdown, was it week 14, week 15 against the Patriots on that Sunday night snow game where he had that 50-yard touchdown in overtime? And that was just, that was that's number one for me. Okay. I still have to put his Super Bowl touchdown as number one. Ah. It, it's hard. I mean, that's such a big moment. The The offense was struggling. Pretty much C.J. Anderson was the offense that day, as little offense as the Broncos had. But it just uh, – I think it was Luke Kukley had him like for about a yard short of the touchdown, and he just extended himself, did everything possible to get into that end zone. 
And uh, so that, that's a memory that'll stick with me just because that was such a, a momentous game. Nobody gave the Broncos any kind of chance. And and even a lot of Broncos country was kind of struggling to see how the Broncos were going to win that one. I'm a part of that a little bit. I thought they had a chance just because of the defense, but that was going to be a, a tough game for sure because, man, Carolina was loaded. But again, just that Super Bowl touchdown. I will definitely remember that one. So CJ Anderson, I have nothing but but good things to say about your time here in Denver. And I wish him well wherever he goes. I, I'm guessing good chance Miami is going to be at the top of that list. They were wanting to trade for him earlier in the year and almost had a trade with the Broncos to get Juwan James to the Broncos and CJ Anderson to the Dolphins to be paired with Adam Gase once again. But we'll, we'll see how that plays out. There, there's good options galore for him there's he's gonna be on an nfl roster that's for sure yeah he'll definitely be on an nfl roster but he's not gonna get paid 4.5 million right and that that was the big thing is he's he was a thousand yard rusher this last year one of was it seven or eight guys that were able to rush for a thousand yards yeah and and so that you got to look at the production and say yeah he was a good running back but 4.5 million for a running back is just that's that's a lot in today's nfl especially when you have a great Draft coming up, and we're going to talk about that here in just a bit. So don't, I don't want to get a hold ahead of ourselves here, but that four point five million, and especially when it's all dead money free, that's the, the big thing. The Broncos needed some cap space. I know they still have ten, eleven million dollars, but most of that's going to go to the NFL draft, and so they needed some of that. I, I guess I would call it the 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 free money. That money is the season goes on. If you have injuries, you have to add guys to your roster. Maybe some some roster cuts that you see a guy that's talented that you could maybe add to your roster that can help you. Uh, how do you see the Broncos using this four point five million they just added? Well, it looks like some of it they already added to Chris Harris Jr.'s new deal with, I mean, not really a new deal, but restructured in the sense that there are some incentives on there that could make him up to the sixth highest paid cornerback in the NFL. Now, granted, you know, he has to become an all pro and that's, I mean, that's not definitely not easy to do in the NFL, but that's, that's where some of that money went. And I don't blame them for doing that. I mean, he's not going to hit all the incentives most likely, but I don't mind them doing that. And also it seems like they could, you know, add a, another defensive lineman, depending on what happens with Gatsas or another edge rusher, linebacker, cornerback, or a uh, receiving weapon, or heck, even another running back. You could split that 4.5 between two or three veterans that, you know, they're kind of more bottom of the barrel scrap heap types where you're hoping to get lucky, but you need those guys. And sometimes you find some gold in those areas that guys compete and just kind of click in the offense or the system you're running and Definitely makes sense, especially, I mean, C.J. Anderson, it wasn't just $4.5 million saved. His contract was four point five with zero dead cap. So there's no real cap ramifications from releasing him, at least negative ramifications. Right. So now, just looking at who the Broncos still have on their, their roster with Devontae Booker, D'Angelo Henderson, the, the two young guys, uh, we know that the Broncos are much higher on Devontae Booker than probably anybody else. Media fans, anybody, I've kind of looked at this and gone, man, Booker hasn't really lived up to what many thought he would be. And yet the Broncos still seem high that this guy can turn into something. Even with that said, do you see any free agent options that you would really not mind seeing the Broncos bring bring in for at least training camp? Well, I know there's a name that kind of some Bronco fans will remember, but Jonah Williams the guy that they had on the roster, Jonathan Williams, not Jonah, Jonathan Williams. And he's a running back from Arkansas. They had him on the practice squad. They paid him a lot of money to be on the practice squad. And then the Saints poached him. Well, he's a free agent again. So he's somebody that I wouldn't be surprised if he found his way back to the Broncos after the draft. But then there's some higher name guys that people will recognize. DeMarco Murray is still on the market. Alfred Morris is an interesting one. Charles Sims, Orleans Darkwa. Terrence West, Braden Oliver, and Andre Ellington, some of the better known names. So just like Steven Ridley last year, I'd expect the Broncos to bring in at least one veteran running back that'll compete. And you never know, you might catch lightning in a bottle and get some luck because it looks like the Broncos, at least, you know, depending on what happens with the draft here, but it looks like they're going to be going to more of a running back by committee approach with Booker Henderson and potentially a, another free agent added or a running back in the draft. Well, any of those names you listed that really stick out to you that you wouldn't mind the Broncos bringing in? I wouldn't mind them bringing in Alfred Morris just because he's another between the tackles kind of runner where you can get him much cheaper than what C.J. Anderson was getting paid. 
And again, I mentioned earlier, Jonathan Williams, I think he'd be an interesting one to bring back as well. And even if he's just competing for running back three or four or anything like that, I mean, there's, there's value there because running backs get dinged up. I mean, look at CJ Anderson. This is the, the first time in his career he played 16 games. So that's, that's another reason that he was released. He, he's dealt with some injuries. He's getting older and his, his yards per carry dropped tremendously over the past two seasons. He went from 5.4 to 4.7 to 4.7 down to four and 4.1 the last two years. So Running backs, they wear down. There's a reason that running backs, the top two paid running backs in the NFL are on their rookie deals. Teams just do not want to pay those guys after they get past that rookie deal because their value and their usage and their ability drops dramatically. So not going to pay a lot for a running back, and I think that's probably the way the, the Broncos are looking at it too. So now looking at the the upcoming NFL draft, I've, I've seen a lot of people tweet about this, that maybe the C.J. Anderson cut – means the Broncos are going to go a little bit higher on when they're going to take a, a running back in this upcoming draft. Even a lot of people saying that number five pick with Saquon Barkley is now very much a, a real option. Is there anything you're hearing about that? Of, of Have the Broncos really changed that much that they just love Barkley that much? that They're like, hey, we can let CJ Anderson go. Let's go get Barkley. Everything I've heard over and over again is that the Broncos are not looking to take a running back with their first or second round pick. Now, things could change. Let's say like Darius Geis falls to the Broncos' second-round pick. Doubtful, but you never know. Then there's an option, but it really does not sound like with Gary Kubiak leading the way, like we talked about in the last podcast where we talked about the top non-quarterback options at five, it doesn't sound like the Broncos are looking towards running back at five. And it does not I don't think that takes away from Saquon Barkley, the player, but because of that slotted rookie contract and the fifth-year option, drafting Barkley at five has long-term cap ramifications that he's just he's just not going to be a value on his rookie contract you know you want to make sure that rookie guy if you're if you're playing the game right in my opinion at least it's not just taking best player available but you got to take best player available at a value and if you're taking Saquon Barkley you're not getting a contractual value with him so I think that takes him off the list Geis obviously isn't going at five if the Broncos trade down and let's say Geis is there at 22 maybe but I don't see it I don't even see the day two options really Nick Chubb from Georgia I think he will be there at 40. Does the Broncos take him at 40? I think they'll prioritize cornerback, inside linebacker, edge rusher, defensive line, wide receiver, or offensive line slash quarterback, all before running back in those top, with picks in the top 50. And that goes for Ronald Jones from USC and Sony Michelle as well. Where things get interesting is round three onwards. The Broncos have made, I mean, a lot lot of visits with Rashad Penny. And then there's some guys, day three, Late day two, that interests me a lot. Carry uh, on Johnson's an interesting between the tackles runner. And I think my favorite projected day three guys for the Broncos, I really like John Kelly from Tennessee. He runs extremely tough. Guy's got incredible balance. And I also really like Kalen Balaj from Arizona State. Not the best vision between the tackles, but a huge guy. And he runs a little upright, but he is kind of a, just an X factor at running back. He's not a true between the tackles banger like C.J. Anderson was, but you're using a system with a little bit more quick passing. Balaj runs routes very effectively, and I know you got a chance to see him at the Senior Bowl, and he was very effective there. Especially as a, a receiving option. Yeah. He was <laughs> – this is going to be weird to say, but of all the, the receiving options that were there, I would put him top three. That includes wide receivers, tight ends, all that that group. He just had great route running for a running back. That was what kind of shocked me. They stuck him out there at that wide receiver position on some some different drills just to see how he'd handle it. And then he was unstoppable in the one-on-one drills with linebackers. And and that's I, I do have to say that drill is set up for failure for the linebacker. But still, this guy just embarrassed people. I mean, he had guys on their butts just having no – idea where he was going to take off for a, for a, a wide receiver route. So he would be a great option. And and like you said, depending on how the Broncos want to design their offense, he could be that, that really great option for them just to, to be able to move around and teams have to really adjust to him. I always love this is this maybe gush over the Patriots a little too much, but, but there are times where it's just, Hey, they are the, the cream of the crop. They are the the standard that you're looking to get to. And I love how they use their running backs. They are those multiple option players that they can, they can run between the tackles if they need to. They got speed to get to the edges. You can stick them out there as a wide receiver if you need to. 
And then the big thing that they use them for is just to to understand the, the defensive scheme that they're playing against. A lot of times they'll start with them out as a receiver and then see if somebody will come with them to the middle just to see if it's man coverage or zone coverage. And Kalen Balazs, he's one of those guys, he gives you that option because you can stick him out there at that wide receiver position and leave him there, and teams have to respect what he can bring to the table. So, yeah, that the day three option, I, I wouldn't mind seeing some of these running backs. Mark Walton's another one that I like. Uh, like you said, John Kelly, carry on Johnson. He was when Auburn really kind of turned things around this season, carry on Johnson was a really big part of that. He he's a guy that I, I question his vision. That's my, my big thing with him. I, I just don't know. Does he need that giant hole to run through? Once he gets there, he is very, very tough to bring down, but I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see how he develops a little bit here, but it's really tough for me when I look at those day two options that you listed off. Nick Chubb, Ronald Jones, Sony Michelle, Rashad Penny. These are all guys that I really, really like and see as those those day one starters in the NFL. Nick Chubb especially is one of those guys I think he could end up as the most productive running back out of this group, out of this entire draft. If he goes through, I mean, with running backs and with all players, it's a matter of which team they go to, how they use them, those kind of things. But I just, I think he's just getting stronger and stronger. And I think he's getting back to that potential that you saw when he first started at Georgia before his injury and was looking like that guy that's going to be that next top 10 pick at at running back. But again, these are, are great players that bring a lot to a team wherever they go. And so it'd be tough for me to pass. But again, this is, this is where, I, I've done you and I've both done tons of mock drafts and and things like that, looking at how the Broncos could set up, and that that day two picks. There's so many options, so many different directions the Broncos can go, and still be very happy with what they bring to the table. So if they go running back, I'd be happy, but I, I think day three really is more of that place to go to. It just seems like the the running back depth and just the ability to find guys that can be quality starters. I was looking the other day at. And uh, at fifth round and beyond players who became pro bowl kind of players who became actually very, very productive at their position and, and running back kept sticking out running back and special teams. Those were the two positions. If you were looking for pro bowl players in the fifth round and beyond, that's where you find them. That that's that, those are the positions that you go for. And so again, day three, that fits perfect. Broncos have those two fifth round picks. I could see one one of those going to running back for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the earliest I see him using that pick on a running back is that comp pick in the third round. So I, we could see potentially a Penny or Kalen Balazs, both guys that reportedly the Broncos are pretty high on. But then you got a lot of day three guys. You mentioned some. Mark Walton from Miami is an interesting guy. Royce Freeman. Daryl Williams from LSU is a very interesting one that I don't think gets as much hype as he should because he ran behind Geis. The Josh Adams from Notre Dame, Naheem Hines, who I think is a little better for his zone scheme, but very explosive. Akron Wildley from Iowa is an interesting guy. And Bo Scarborough, who tested through the roof of the combine, very surprising. Then there's some sleepers as well. I mean, everybody keeps saying this is a deep running back class. It's a deep running back class, guys. One of my favorite sleepers is Keith Ford from Texas A&M. He might be an undrafted free agent, but I love him from a, for a between-the-tackles runner. Jordan Chun from Troy is somebody that Eric Trickle likes a lot. Uh, Chase Edmonds from Fordham is a guy that was killing it at the Shrine Bowl this year. Rock Thomas went to Auburn before transferring out. He was like the number one running back recruit in the country. Philip Lindsay from Colorado, probably a round six or seven guy. But if he's undrafted, I think Denver obviously makes a lot of sense. And then two guys that Broncos have brought in in some of their pre-draft visits are Gus Edwards from Rutgers and Trenton Cannon from Virginia. So I would expect the Broncos to use a draft pick on running back, bring in a undrafted free agent or two at running back, as well as sign a veteran free agent like for about league minimum to all to compete at camp and but go with the best four. And that's that seems like the way they're going. Running backs a scheme and talent around them, dependent position. So I I as much as I enjoy Barkley and you know we've we've hyped him up on here because he is a supreme talented guy, but I don't think I personally could use a top five pick on running back. And if I did, you'd either need to have a a franchise quarterback or be a top five offensive line. You know, if the Broncos had the, one of those things in place with a great defense and they're like, oh, my gosh, we're just a Saquon Barkley away from being Super Bowl contenders. You know what? Th- then I get it. Are the Broncos a Saquon Barkley away from being Super Bowl contenders? 
I think they have too many holes and too many questions at other important positions that I, I can't answer that yes with a straight face. I'm with you. And and that's that's a big reason. I mean, we've talked about it on the show some of why we both really like the idea of going for quarterback of the future in this draft. Because do you really see a guard, a running back, or even, I mean, a pass rusher can make a, a huge impact, but even there, if, if Bradley Chubb is there at five, can you see those guys getting us over the top of beating the Patriots or the Steelers or the Jacksonville Jaguars right now? Hell, the Chargers. Uh, yeah, exactly. They're, they're a very loaded team. I just talked about that with with one of our, our good get friends and uh, on, on his podcast. They're just they're, there's some top end talent in, in the AFC. It's, it's not a it's not as deep as the NFC by any means. But those top teams, that's what you're measuring yourself against. And are we one of those teams? And and if we're trying to be as honest as we can, I, I think the Broncos can get to the playoffs. But can they can they beat those teams? And there's just a lot of questions on this team right now. There'd be a, there'd have to be a lot of things that go exactly right to to make that happen. Where Case Keenum's going to have to play maybe even better than he did last year. The offensive line is going to have to show some incredible growth from from last year to this year. The defense, some stars are going to have to emerge from some of those guys that have shown a little bit of potential but haven't really put it all together. Bradley Roby is going to have to step up. You're, I don't know. There's just a lot of things that are going to have to really plan, pan out for the Broncos. Coaching to, competency. Well, yeah, and, and we haven't even talked about the coaching staff and, and how, how good or bad are they. Was it more because the quarterback play was that bad or was it that the Broncos just don't have the answer at coach right now? So th- there's just more questions about the Broncos than those other teams. I can look at the Patriots and say, okay, yes, they have holes, but they have a lot of things in place that I wish the Broncos would have. Same with the Steelers, same with the, the Jaguars. So it just, there's, there's quite the challenge to, to really justify taking that running back or, like you said, that, that guard there at five and feeling really good about that decision. I'm not saying we don't get a talented player because we would. Saquon Barkley, Nelson, both very, very talented players, maybe the top two players in this draft. If we are going talent alone, taking position out of it, talent alone, I think I would have those two guys at the top of my board. But as you know, talent alone isn't the only part of the equation when it comes to looking for players for your team. Yep. If you're just going purely best player available, given the new CBA and the rookie slotted contracts, you're going to be playing checkers while every other GM is going to be playing chess. And you're just not going to create the value that you need to. Because when you have a quarterback or an edge rusher on that cheap rookie contract, you know what that does? If you have a good starter there for four or five years, it opens up money so you can spend money elsewhere. You know, you want to get another good guard? Guess what? You have the cap now because you're paying a rookie penny on the dollars for their production. That's not the case when you're paying a guard or a running back that top five pick contract. So... Definitely, definitely have to think about it. It's not just purely best player available. Uh, once you get past round one, uh, then you can start to look at it a little differently. Just let the board fall to you. But round one, I think, I think you got to play a numbers game as well. So that's just my opinion. You, like you said last week, you don't know anybody who's as gung ho about positional value in their draft boards as me. But I, I think Elway's ta- showed me the way. And granted, they've they stunk so far the past two years, but that's because they don't have their quarterback in place. So. Hopefully that'll change, whether it be Keenum or something else, but we'll see from there. Now, we still have a bit to get to here, but first we want to say thank you to our great sponsor, Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash huddle up. Over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com backslash huddle up. All right, well, this podcast, I feel like we have been leading the charge as far as the Broncos podcast for Broncos should pick a quarterback with the fifth pick or first round, wherever they move up or stay at five. But it's sounding more and more possible that the Broncos either A, won't have the quarterback they want at five, fall to them, B, won't trade up for the guy they want, and C, potentially either take a guard or a linebacker, potentially at five, or trade down with the Bills. There's been a lot of talk about the Broncos and Bills being a potential spot for a trade if Josh Allen is there with the fifth pick, which he should be, but... Who knows? The NFL is crazy. So we decided that today, you know, we, when we first started the this season's draft podcast shows, 
we started talking about some of these quarterbacks, but we figured we'd do a little bit a quicker section here. If you want to go back way back to some of these longer scouting reports on these quarterbacks, you can, but non day one quarterback options for the Broncos, because you can bet your horses. The Broncos are going to be adding a quarterback sometime in this draft. First overall, our first pick, maybe, maybe not, but they're absolutely going to add another quarterback to compete with this team. I do not think Elway will be happy at all to go into next season with just Keenum, Lynch, and Chad Kelly. There's talent there, there's upside, but as you saw at the Eagles this last year, having good depth at the quarterback position, I mean, look, at they had Chase Daniels, Nick Foles, Carson Wentz, Sam Bradford. They A lot of those guys go, they got comp pick for Chase Daniels. They got a whole bunch of draft capital for Sam Bradford. Now if they want to trade Nick Foles, they could probably get two twos for him. Look at the Patriots, Tom Brady, but you know what? They took up quarterback Jimmy Garoppolo in the second round turned into multiple second round picks, early second round picks too. So it's never a bad idea to stack at the quarterback position, probably more so than any other position. I know you only see one on the field at a time, but it can make or break a coach's career, whether or not they have that quarterback there. And you can always flip that talent later for more assets. So that's my stance on it. (laughs) Personally, I don't know. Do you stay, do you agree with me there, Carl? Oh yeah, completely. Good to get quarterback in this, this class. While there is some good talent at the top, there's a lot of other names to look at as well. And I have a list of 11 guys here. There's more than 11 other quarterbacks, obviously. But some of the the better well-known top 11 guys. And some of these guys might go round one. Honestly, the top two that I have listed here is Mason Rudolph from Oklahoma State and Kyle Loetta from Richmond. I've heard rumors that both of these guys could be in the cards for a team to take middle of round one for Rudolph, which I think would be insane, personally, to the end of round one for Kyle Loetta. Rudolph, for me, is a guy who reminds me a lot of Mike Glennon he's he improved this year in the pocket, which was a big issue I had with him coming into the season. But I feel like he doesn't throw with the best anticipation and his accuracy down the field. It leaves a little bit to be desired. He had two very talented wide receivers in that spread them out, throw it down the field offense that Oklahoma state runs and Marcel Aitman and James Washington. And I feel like a lot of times those guys down the field specifically would have to adjust and make plays to make Mason Rudolph, you know, put up the stats that he did. And I like Rudolph as a mid round two option. And obviously that you have to pay a premium at quarterback. So if the Broncos didn't go quarterback round one and they took Rudolph round two. I would get it. I think it's a little bit of a reach, but you know what? That's, that's the quarterback market. Kyle Oletta is a little different. He's not, doesn't have the stature that Mason Rudolph has, but goodness, that guy throws into tight windows. It's, it's very fun to watch him play. He doesn't have the big arm or the big tools. He's not a huge athlete, but I think he's very intelligent and he can fit the ball into some of the tightest spots that I've seen. Him and Baker Mayfield, I think, have some of the tighter window throws. Uh, Rosen, too, sometimes. But in this class, I think those three throwing into tight windows into coverage accurately and giving their guys a chance to do something with the ball after the catch, Kyle Lutt is really good there. And I I wouldn't be surprised at all if the Broncos were very high on him because I think he could run an offense very similar to Case Keenum. He's pretty good under pressure, too, from what I saw. And then the last guy that I'm going to touch on here before I kick it over to you is a guy that I've heard the Broncos are interested in. He's interesting. He's, he's a big guy. I think he's 6'5", and he threw pretty well at the combine. He's another guy whose arm isn't as big as his stature would suggest, but he has some wheels on him. He's not an incredible athlete, but he can throw on the move, and there's some throws in his tape that are NFL quality. Now, it's not consistent. He has some mechanical issues, but give him a year or two on the bench, and I could see this guy developing into a starter with a good system around him, and that is Marshall, the thundering herd, Chase Litton quarterback for Marshall. So he's somebody that intrigues me a lot. And his tape was pretty fun. I feel like he's, he wasn't getting a lot of hype about a month ago in this draft process. And now it seems like he's starting to pick up a little bit of steam. And I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up being a day two selection for the Broncos. All, all very good. Yeah. Very good choices there. And, and, and where I I would take them as well. I'm with you on Mason Rudolph of it. He's one of those guys I, I want to love. I really, really want to like him because I do think he is a really good guy. I've heard a lot of great things about his work in, in meetings and answering questions and and just being a very, very smart guy, very grounded, very, very likable. But so was Brock Osweiler. So <laughs> that that's uh, sometimes that's almost my, my comparison for him just because I think Brock Osweiler was a little bit in the same way of he's big. But I never thought his arm matched up to his stature. And Mason Rudolph is his arm is is okay. It's it's average, above average. Again, he has good size. He's not very athletic. 
I, that's something else that kind of sticks out to me. Like that, that's something that that is hard for me to get past with with Baker Mayfield is just his athleticism on the field. I know he's not the fastest guy, but, but he just he seems to make guys miss and and make plays that that other guys just would not have made. The same with with Darnold as well. That there's just that little bit of athleticism to to make guys miss and make some plays out of nothing. Rosen, he's more athletic than I give him credit for. I, I've seen him take off running a few more times. I've went back and watched a few more of his games just in the hopes that maybe he would fall to the Broncos. And and he does. He has a little more athleticism. He just doesn't have the athleticism of Darnold or, or Baker. But that's that's just here and there. But, but Mason Rudolph, he's just a statue in that he really needs his offensive line to do a lot of good things for him. So second round, I could get behind it. I wouldn't be happy about it, but I could get behind it. Kyle Lalada, I'm with you there. I, I remember asking you guys about him, uh, what was it, like three months ago, you and Eric? Mm-hmm. And both of you were kind of like, yeah, he's he's okay. He's not, I mean, I, and I think he's kind of improved his draft stock as as this whole season has gone on. He's proven himself that that he can hang at the at the senior bowl. I'd say other than Baker Mayfield, Loletta had the the next best senior bowl. And I'm talking during the week of practice. I'm not talking about the game because I know everybody's going to be like, oh my gosh, you saw Josh Allen at the game, right? He had great stats. And okay, that, that's that's completely different. Loletta actually looked like he belonged. And I heard he did great in interviews with teams. Just a very likable guy again. And he's very, very smart. Something to keep in mind with him is that he had, I think, what was it, three different systems while he was in college and and was able to handle all three different systems. All coaches were very impressed with how quickly he learned it. Not quite to the level of Josh Rosen, but that next tier down of just being able to, to work with the system and and work within it and, and be able to produce in multiple systems. So definitely a guy that to, to keep an eye on. Mike White is another guy from Western Kentucky. He did okay at the Senior Bowl. Not my my favorite player there. He's just kind of hit and miss on, on what he brought to the table, but he kind of brings that size that the Broncos kind of like, that six foot four, two twenty four. Just uh he's got pretty good size. He's pretty accurate and and he's pretty smart from what I understand. So I, and then my final guy I want to talk about here, Kurt Binkert of Virginia. He is one of the most maddening players at the quarterback position in this draft for me. And because my, my very first game watching this guy was his game against Miami. And Nick, if you had just watched his Miami game, what round would you take Kurt Benkert? Well, it's kind of hard to judge anybody off of one game, but his flashes in that game looked like a first round pick. Right. Right. No, I, I agree. You, you got to watch more than one game to ever. But I had somebody send me his his game saying, hey, have you watched this guy? And so I started watching him and I watched that Miami game and I was like, oh my gosh, why is this guy not getting talked about more? And then I watched other games and I'm like, this is why he's not getting talked about more. So he he has his flashes. He has his moments where he just makes some incredible throws in that Miami game. He had some deep throws that were just right on stride to the, to the wide receiver. It was perfect. Loved it. And he's got a strong arm. He's got enough size. He's a decent athlete. There's just a lot to like, but he just doesn't see the field very well. You can tell he just doesn't always feel comfortable in the pocket. He doesn't, when defenses seem to figure him out, he just, he struggles to get to that second, third, fourth, three. And he just kind of relies on natural ability to try to go out there and win. And that's kind of what the Broncos just had in Paxton Lynch. They're hoping they can turn that natural ability into a quarterback. And we've seen how that worked out. Not great. So yeah. he's a guy, again, he's very maddening. If you could get him in that that fifth, sixth round and just have him sit on the bench, maybe learn how to play quarterback, you could maybe get something out of him. But I, I feel like he's that looks like Tarzan plays like Jane kind of mentality. Yeah. I don't think he's ever going to live up to the the hope that you're going to expect from him. He has arm talent and he's a pretty athletic guy. So he will get a chance day three. And if you know, he has those things. So somebody's going to give him a chance for sure. And if the Broncos are looking quarterback day three, he'd probably be the guy that I'd be interested in because of those tools. 
But does he ever get it together? Probably not. I mean, that's that's what you get for drafting a quarterback day three. I mean, how many have worked out in the last 20 years and don't name Brady <laughs> or Dak? Like, right. how many of those guys worked out? Right. So, yeah, it's, we'll see. It's not the, the odds of, of a quarterback after the third round working out are not good. Honestly, a quarterback after the top 10 working out is not that high either. So it's just that you get what you pay for. Yeah. If you go bargain bin shopping, you can't expect to pull out an all pro. And but they're I know lottery every, tickets. They're lottery tickets. Right. Right. Every once in a while, somebody's going to win. And I know everybody keeps looking at the at the Patriots and saying, oh, they found that quarterback in the sixth round. You don't need to take a quarterback in the first round. Again, like you said, how many quarterbacks in the last 20 years beyond Brady and and Dak? I mean, he's been good. He hasn't he's still had his struggles, though, even yeah. as a fourth round quarterback. So he hasn't been that all pro level like Tom Brady. So the odds are, are very, very slim. But, hey, yeah, sometimes you just got to take that chance and see what you get. Yeah. And some other guys that I want to mention here, Brandon Silvers from Troy, who gosh, he was at the senior bowl, but didn't even get to get to play. I feel like they just like totally didn't even let him play. He is uh, from Troy. He's an interesting guy. He probably a backup fighting for a third during most of his career. Luke Falk, who put up great numbers, but man, I just don't see any draftable traits. He does throw sometimes with decent touch and accuracy, but his arm is literally like 50 year old Chad Pennington level. It is that weak. And he has no pocket awareness. I mean, he literally just goes back there. First read. There it is. Puts it off. That's I see nothing there that makes me want to draft him. Logan Woodside is a guy that I think is pretty interesting, but he's his tools are so limited. He's small, doesn't have a big arm, and he's not a great athlete. So that's that kind of hurts him a lot. But he's shown he can run offenses, so he's interesting there. Nick Shimanick from Texas Tech. He's a transfer from the University of Iowa. He has a decent arm talent, but he's going to take a few years from that spread system, and he doesn't have the the pure tools that Mahomes had. Riley Ferguson, another interesting guy, but he's just he's erratic. He has going to need to put on a lot of weight too, and he has some injury issues. And the same with. Jeremiah Briscoe from Sam Houston State. So, honestly, if, I think the Broncos will be bringing a quarterback at some point, and it might be one of these guys. But if they don't go one round two, I would I would be pretty surprised if they didn't look that way. If they don't go one round one, I would be pretty surprised if they don't look that way day two. And guys like Litton and La 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 are my favorite two if the Broncos are going quarterback. Yeah, I'm with you there. It, it's hard to picture them not going quarterback at some point and at least trying to find a guy that can compete. Uh, I had this conversation with somebody earlier this week, actually, and somebody had suggested the Broncos weren't going to take a quarterback in this draft. And I I just can't see them being fully comfortable with just case Keenum, Paxton Lynch and, and Kelly being in that quarterback room. I mean, that's there's potential there, but you like to add a little bit more competition and see what you can get. And so one of these guys in that second, third round, it's it's again where because both of us want quarterback so bad in the first, it'd be disappointing, but it would be understanding if they can't get to that position because I think you got information earlier this today about what it would take to trade up, what teams are wanting, and it is it is astronomical. You're really putting all of your eggs in one basket and hoping this works out. So, and of course that could be just what said team was wanting in a trade and it could come down, you know, like ask for the world and then negotiate down. Right. So we'll see, but I would be shocked if the Broncos didn't go quarterback sometime in this draft. And if I'm taking a chance on a guy day two, Litton or Loretta, day three, Ben Kurt, maybe somebody else. I don't know. At that point, (laughs) at that point, day three, it's just a, a hope and a prayer. So. Real quick before we we move on, I want to ask you about one name. And I know the Broncos aren't very high on him, but I I just, where would you take uh, Lamar Jackson? Where would you actually take him in the draft? I would take him about the same place that he'd be a first round pick, but it would be like in the last 10 picks in the first round. And where do you think he actually goes? I honestly have no idea. I've heard as high as the Chargers and I've heard as low as the Patriots at 31. So we'll see. I think somebody's going to end up taking him round one, though. Just because of the quarterback, getting that fifth-year option is huge. Can't disagree with that. All right. Well, we're going to move on to our, our final segment here today. And 
we we're talking about what we wanted to talk about this week. And just because this is the, the week of lies in the NFL where everybody's trying to get false information out there, trying to get teams to panic, uh, just trying to get them to, to make crazy trades, whatever it may be out there. But, but we want to talk about what would be some draft day nightmares that, that could happen for the Broncos, just things that would make us pull out our hair, throw something at the TV. I, I, I'm going to have to tell the guy that I'm hanging out with, if any of these happen, he better make sure there's nothing around that I can throw at his TV. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Mark. I, I don't want to destroy your TV. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, some draft day nightmares. What what would be one of your biggest draft day nightmares? The Patriots trading up and taking Josh Rosen. I feel like there's been a lot of rumors recently gaining steam that the Patriots are very high on Josh Rosen and – my goodness, NFL! If you do this, I this is this has got to be as fixed as wrestling, right? Like, how could you do this? How could you let the Patriots go from Tom Brady to a quarterback like Josh Rosen? I know that he speaks his mind, and there are some concussion concerns there. That's a reason that he's slipping a bit. I think it's the medicals in combination to his political outspokenness and questions there. But if you let the Patriots and Bill Belichick. Get rid of Jimmy Garoppolo. I mean, they just got rid of Jimmy Garoppolo. So, like, this is our chance to, like, finally put the, yeah, a stake in the heart of the Patriots. I'm sorry. I really hate them, as, if that's a little graphic. I didn't say knife. A stake in the heart of the Patriots. <laughs> Jimmy Garoppolo is gone. Bill Belichick's getting older. Tom Brady doesn't have long left. Like, this is our chance. But then you let them go up and get Josh Rosen. I mean, screw me. I, I will be beyond beside myself. Like, I'm going to be really disappointed if and when the Broncos pass Josh Rosen at five, if that happens. But if that happens and then you see the Patriots springboard like up to nine and get Josh Rosen, I, I, I don't know what I'd do. I, I, I'm going to be very upset. I, yeah, I, I understand. You and I both have Josh Rosen as our number one quarterback in this draft. And so then to see him go to the Patriots of all teams. I mean, I, the only other team I can think of that I would be more upset is if he went to the Raiders. But they already have quarterback, a young quarterback in Derek Carr. So that's not going to happen. But maybe maybe worst case scenario would be the the Raiders trading with the Patriots for them to come up and get Josh Rosen and the Raiders then getting lots of draft capital. Oh, my gosh, that would be that would be my draft day nightmare. But another one for me just kind of tied into that would be if if the Broncos stay at five and Josh Rosen or Baker Mayfield are on the board at five and the Broncos choose to pass on them. I, yeah. I mean, not, not I, I just, yeah, I, I, I can't, I can't even fathom that that could happen. I know that they are higher on Case Keenum than probably the media or the fans, but I'm sorry, you, you, you get these guys on a rookie contract and have them tied in for the next five years, and these guys are high competitors. They bring a lot to your team. It just, it sets you up so well as a franchise especially when you look at what's happening with the Steelers, what's happening with the Patriots and their quarterbacks getting a little bit older. There's just this incredible vacuum in the AFC right now for an opportunity for some team just to rise up as that next great franchise. And I feel like if the Broncos got Josh Rosen or Baker Mayfield, that would be them. But there, there's, there's rumors that they would, they would pass on at least Josh Rosen. I don't know if they'd pass on Baker Mayfield, but like you said, there, there's some more concerns that seem to be coming out about Josh Rosen. And I feel like it's the Patriots working the system again, like getting everybody fired up of, oh man, those concussion things, it's worse than, than you thought. Or, oh man, his parents are not sure how much longer he's going to play football. And uh, there's just all these things circulating out there right now. And I just feel like it's the Patriots. Like you said, they're, they're playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers to get their guy. Oh, I just, if the Patriots get him, I'm going to be upset. <laughs> I don't even know. I'll just cry. Uh, <laughs> number five for me personally, it would be staying at five and I'll be not super happy if they take Quentin Nelson at five. I think he's going to be a good player. Also, if for you listeners that don't follow on me on Twitter, you might laugh at this. Uh, Quentin Nelson is known for having a quick block trick finger on Twitter. So I went and check his profile and he blocked me. So that let that be a lesson to all of you. If you 
say anything negative about Quentin Nelson at all and you don't want to be blocked by him, then just keep it to yourself. I don't really mind. I think it's hilarious. And I fully, honestly, he went up in my rankings for the level of pettiness and blocking my big mouth up. So I, I, I actually appreciate it. But just a just a funny story out there. The best block of his career to date, blocking me on Twitter. So that that's fantastic. But worse than that, staying at five and taking Minka Fitzpatrick. I think he's going to be a good player in the NFL. I think he's going to be a leader. But I think he, if there's one position on the Broncos roster that they are good at, it's safety. And the best young player on the entire team, in my opinion, is free safety Justin Simmons. While Minka Fitzpatrick, I think, is a better version of Justin Simmons as far as the ability to drop in and play some nickel coverage as well, play at nickelbacker. Justin Simmons already does that pretty well, so I think that's a big overlap of skill set. And personally, I think Minka Fitzpatrick, unless they trade down to 12 and he's there, then I could potentially, you know, he's at 12 and he's the best player on your board and makes a strong unit even stronger, strengthening his strength. Then I get it. But taking taking Minka Fitzpatrick at five, I think, would be absolutely ludicrous and I personally wouldn't touch him in the top 10 of the draft. I can't disagree with you, which is crazy because I, I remember sometime, uh, I can't remember when it was, maybe back in December or January, we were doing a top 10 mock draft with Eric. And we voted to have Mika Fitzpatrick be the pick for the Broncos at five. Yeah. And <laughs> here we are, both of us now kind of going, and, and I, I, I guess a shout out to Eric because he was the one that was like, no, this would be stupid. Don't do it. And we're both like, oh, he's a very talented player. He would, he'd would he be a great addition to the Broncos. And now we're both like, no, don't take him at five. So, <laughs> hey, Eric, you were ahead of your time, man. So appreciate you, you blazing the, tra- the trail for us. But uh, another guy for me at taking at five or earlier would be Josh Allen. I just don't see – I know everybody keeps saying he has the highest ceiling of all these players, all these quarterbacks – and while he has the great tools, I, I still even there say I don't think he has the highest ceiling because I don't think he has the the strongest quarterback mind. I, I just don't think it's there. And and so I, I just don't see him as having that highest ceiling. And so, I mean, while I would try to justify it in my head if the Broncos actually made the pick, I'd sit there and say, OK, well, maybe they'll turn these tools into something. Maybe they'll do what they tried to do with Paxton Lynch and Josh Allen will actually be that guy that puts in the work and and becomes that player. But I, I just it would take a lot for me to convince myself that, that pick was OK. And I, I just would rather see them actually make the trade and just get out of there. Try to add to the team around what they have already and let somebody else overpay for a quarterback I just don't see being that franchise guy moving forward. Yeah, I can't I can't disagree with you. I think Josh Allen is a better option than he was when the season ended because he did improve, I think, throughout the, the year, and he did not have a great running game at Wyoming. That definitely had an effect on him, but I just I'd rather take a quarterback who can do the consistent thing every day and sometimes make the splash plays than a guy that you have to rely on the splash plays but struggles to do the consistent thing. So, I mean, that, that maybe it's a little bit of a overreaction to the Paxton Lynch, what has been so far a monumental bust. But I, I don't know. I, I'm definitely a little bit concerned with him there, and I think that he just isn't a good fit also with Case Keenum. I mean, you want to have a guy that can run a similar offense. You don't want to have the identity crisis that the Broncos have had the past few seasons with – you know, going from Trevor Simeon to Paxton Lynch, you play polar opposite style offenses because they have totally opposite skill sets. So it'll be it'll be interesting there. But I Josh Allen at five. Josh Allen might be the fifth overall pick, but I don't think it'll be with the Broncos. Let me put it that way. The only other scenario that I'd be very disappointed in is if the Broncos do find a trade partner to trade back and they just don't get the value that I think they should. Yep. That, that would be the, the Broncos haven't always done great at getting what I would consider top value. Uh, I, I look at what the Colts just got from from the Jets and I'm going, man, they got a huge haul just for a team to move up a few picks. And so if there's a quarterback there and teams are fighting, the Broncos should get an amazing draft haul. If, if the Bills are trying to trade up, I'm saying I want both of your first round picks. I want at least one of your second round picks this year, second round pick next year, third round pick this year. I, I'm I'm raking them over the coals 
kind of thing. I'm, I'm making sure that I'm getting everything possible that I can to, to make sure that I can build my team for the future. And if we could get a first round pick for next year, that would be even greater. Uh, I know like Arizona's thinking about trying to trade up. I would absolutely tell them I need first and second and third this year, first next year, and probably at least a fourth round pick next year, if not more for them to move up those 10 spots. And because I, I don't think Arizona is going to be a, a playoff team next year, especially if they draft, draft Josh Allen, I think they would be a bottom 10 team. So I could see the Broncos actually getting a top 10 pick out of that trade. But again, that, that's, that would be a very huge disappointment if, if they did trade back and just didn't get what they should for a quarterback. Yep. I am in complete agreement with you there. That was honestly the one that I was going to use. So I think we, uh, since we did a podcast on Sunday, we can cut it a little bit shorter today and we can get on out of here. How's that okay. sound? That sounds good, man. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up this week's episode of Building the Broncos, our new name for this podcast. You can find Carl on Twitter at Carl Dumbler MHH and myself at Nick Kendall MHH. Also, make sure you head on over to Mile High Huddle, an affiliate of 247 Sports and CBS Sports Digital, to find ours and our co writers' latest content, not just related to the draft, but all things that pertain to your Denver Broncos. Carl, I know you have a piece that you just sent in. Can you tell the listeners what you should be dropping here pretty soon? Yeah, so it should be out by the time this podcast actually comes out. But uh, I, I just did a, a film piece on Sue Cravens from his rookie season with the, the Washington Redskins and went through most of his rookie season watching the games. And it's it's interesting trying to find a part time player because he wasn't a full time starter for them his rookie year. And so trying to watch the numbers and trying to figure out, OK, was he in on this play? Was he not? But found some some great plays, some great cut ups of, of just what he brings to the table and then also some things that I just he needs to work on things that he needs to improve on. And uh, he's, if, if, if he reaches his potential, the Broncos just got the steal of the off season. Let me say that if he lets his concussions or injuries come back into play and doesn't quite figure things out, still continues to make some of those rookie mistakes that he was making as a rookie. Then obviously Broncos kind of, Took a chance, but it didn't work out in their favor. So th- there's a lot to like, and there's there's some questions with this game too. But great player. I'm I I was it was a lot of fun to do that piece. Awesome, awesome. And I just had a piece released today that kind of talked about what we discussed earlier with Saquon Barkley and this whole CJ Anderson thing. Broncos, from everything I've heard, everything I've been told, they are not looking to go running back early in the draft. It's probably going to be a late day two to day three thing. Luckily, the Broncos have four early day three picks, you know, two fourths and two fifths. So they got, they got options, but I don't expect them to go Saquon Barkley at five as fun as he would be. And he would definitely be my first pick in fantasy football because I'm a biased player when it comes to that. But I just, I don't think it's happening. So get yourself acquainted to some of these day three guys. And don't be surprised if one of these day three guys ends up being a very good player for the Broncos as soon as next season, because it's a very talented and deep group. I mean, there's names that we didn't even get to. I mean, we've hardly even talked about Naheem Hines and Josh Adams and some other guys that are that are going to be in this class that are very intriguing. Daryl Williams, Royce Freeman. I mean, so there, there's options galore, and the Broncos are going to find, with Gary Kubiak's influence there, they're going to find somebody talented, day three, that's going to compete with Booker and Henderson, who both I have high hopes for as well, you know, especially if you can improve the offensive line, which I already think it's improved with the coaching hires of Sean Coogler, growth from the guys they have on there. And I wouldn't be surprised if they added another talented player there early in the draft. So definitely something to something to look out for there. Make sure you head on over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating and comment. Your support can help us continue to bring you our Denver Bronco deep dives. We aren't just here to bring you the news, but an in-depth analysis each week from building the team, game planning, and 365 days of coverage of the Denver Broncos. You can follow the Huddle Up podcast by subscribing to us on iTunes and for Android users, Stitcher, as well as check us out on YouTube. You can follow us on Twitter at Mile High Huddle and at Huddle Up Pod. Again, please be sure to subscribe and rate us and reach out to us as we love interacting with you fellow Bronco fans. For Carl Dumbler, I'm Nick Kendall wrapping up another episode of the Huddle Up Podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and we will see you next week. Carl, only eight more days. Eight days. I cannot wait, man. I, I am I got all the tingles, all the feelings going on right now. Yeah, that's that's until the pick is announced. Then it's right. either Joy or pure anger. So we'll see. There'll be tears either way. Yeah, exactly. Just don't break your friend's TV. I think of the opposite, the office episode, Michael, 
he's uh, he, about some girl. I know this is kind of a weird rant to finish this thing up with, but he uh, says, all right, I'm either going to be so happy that I burned this place down or so mad that I burned this place down. And uh, yeah, that's, that's how I'm feeling right now. Either way, it's going down in flames. Pretty much. <laughs> all righty. Well, as always, go Broncos and go draft. Mile high huddle.